Okay, this is working well. Awesome. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, that was a really good talk before me, so that's going to be tough to follow up on. Uh, really cool demo in particular. I'm always super impressed when these work without a hitch. Um, so first of all, welcome to my talk. Uh, it's really good cool to be here. What do I want to talk about today? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the lessons that we learned while we were building a red team at Google. Um, and basically, under the right circumstances, a red team can be a pretty cool tool uh, that help you really drive security forward in an organization. Before we start, a little bit about myself. My name is Daniel Fabian. I manage a couple of red teams at Google. I've been there for quite some time, like 12 years or so. Um, originally, red team started as my 20% project. For those folks who don't know, like Google has this 20% concept where basically people can spend 20% of their time not on their core role, but on things they're interested in. And my core role was to do vendor audits. So basically, whenever Google was using a third party, um, we would do penetration tests and security review, which meant that I didn't really get to see anything of like actual Google security, right? Because I was only doing um, penetration tests of the parties. So it seemed like a very nice 20% project as Google didn't have a red team at the site um, to, to start a red team and do um, adversarial simulations uh, against the company. Since then, the, uh, the team has grown quite a bit. Uh, there's actually multiple red teams right now. Um, the, the main one um, has like 25 engineers or so on it right now. Uh, before Google, I, I used to do this also as a job. I was basically like great teamer and penetration tester, funnily enough, at the employer of my previous spe of the previous speaker. Um, so yeah, I don't have a huge social media footprint. Uh, just gonna make sure that uh, like I'm good on the OSINT front. But if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can find me on LinkedIn or the old-fashioned way via email at dfa at google.com. Uh, all right, the agenda. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a red team and why would you want one. Basically, like the purpose of red teaming. Um, then I'm going to talk about how to build a red team. Uh, what capabilities do you want to have on the team? How do you hire for the team? Uh, what relationships and stakeholders do you want to um, get close to? And, and kind of like building out the program. Then I'm going to talk about executing offensive security exercises, like what types of exercises we, we have at Google, uh, what we do when we plan an exercise, uh, what the actual execution looks like, and then what happens once the um, actual execution of an exercise is over. Um, things such as comms, uh, notifications, remediation, improving the detection and response capabilities, and so on. Um, the last two bullets uh, are kind of short, but just like, how does it how does a red team compare, compare to real adversaries? Because there are some important differences that aren't trivial uh, to address and where it's very good if you're at least aware of them. And then finally, what are some things that you can do to optimize uh, your red team to, to get the most value uh, out of it? Basically like random tricks and tips that, that worked for us. All right, so what is a red team? The term comes from the US military. It's honestly super vague, the definition that they came up with, right? It's like structured, iterative process executed by trained team members that provide an independent capability and so on and so on. Like basically it's a process, right? And it doesn't go that much beyond that. Um, but I think it's important to know that red teams can exist in many different areas, right? The, the US military primarily used it in um, like the physical security sense or, or the sense where, where they basi were basically like simulating attacks on bases and stuff like that. Um, but this presentation, on the other hand, I'm focusing on the digital security side because red teams translate very well to the digital realm uh, where basically you build a group of people 
uh, who just step into the shoes of an adversary and then attack the company as an adversary would. Some other areas where raid teams exist and or could exist, um, like I said, physical security is the most obvious one. There's also abuse, right? Like people abusing the applications or products that your company provides in various ways. Um, reliability red team, which probably is a little bit related to, to the security red team as well, since availability is like one of the three parts of the CIA triad. Um, there can also be legal red teams, right? Like lawyers like to do that, that they basically come up with ideas who could see us and they kind of play that uh, out the scenario um, and, and see how, how the company would react. Um, this is potentially a controversial slide, like comparison between security review, penetration test and red team. There are a lot of like religious debates about what the difference uh, between those things are. Personally, I don't have a very strong opinion, but when you build a red team, you kind of have to uh, agree on one definition, right? And this is the definition that worked for us. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right definition for you, um, but it's just important that you kind of like outline what are the parameters of, of um, what you're trying to build. So for us, the differences between security review, penetration test, and red team is in terms of goal, um, the security review tries to identify and address as many weaknesses as possible, right? Uh, it has access to pretty much all the information that is out there. It can talk to the developers that built the product. It can read the source code. They have access to design doc. Basically, any information, it's, it's like a whole open book. Um, it takes commonly days to weeks. I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the product that, that you're reviewing, but somewhere in that range. And they're usually fairly narrowly scoped, right? Um, at Google, we have a ton of products. We constantly launch new features. So when, when you do a security review of a launch, it is typically scoped to like the new feature that is launching or on the original launch, it's like the whole product. Uh, but then it's, it's way more iterative. Uh, a penetration test, on the other hand, attempts to enumerate vulnerabilities and potentially test the exploitability of those. So whereas a security review typically doesn't go like exploiting the bugs that it finds, um, a penetration test definitely goes a step further and also sees if, if they can exploit the issue uh, to, to demonstrate that, yes, this is actually an issue. The level of knowledge varies greatly, right? There's like white box, gray box, black box, depending on how you define your pen test, um, it's, it's different. Uh, the duration typically is in the range of weeks and the scope kind of like varies depending on how you define it. Now, the interesting part is the red team and how we defined it for us. So to us, it's an adversarial simulation. And the primary purpose of a red team is not to find vulnerabilities, but rather to test the DNR uh, detection and response capabilities. So the level of knowledge is limited to just the amount of information that an attacker would have, right? So we pick an attacker that we want to simulate, say, um, a nation state or a criminal group, right? Um, they don't have access to internal information. They don't have access to the source code. So we as a red team also can't use it. On the other hand, if we run an exercise where we simulate a malicious insider, then yes, we do have access to the source code um, if, if the insider that we're simulating would have that access as well. Um, the duration lasts from anywhere to like six weeks to three plus month. Uh, honestly, we're usually more on the longer end than on the shorter end, and we've also run exercises that took like six months. Um, the scope is basically not limited, and this comes from the fact that um, a real attacker usually doesn't limit themselves to a certain scope, right? To them, if say someone wants to compromise a product, they don't really care if they do that via vulnerability in, in the web interface to the product or if they compromise um, a system admin or an SRE that has access to the backend systems and they use their legitimate access uh, to get access to the data. So the scope is completely open um, and it, it's, it's not restricted in, in what the attackers can do beyond the rules of engagement. So ROE is short for rules of engagement, and that's kind of like the outline of what the RAID team is allowed to do and what it's not allowed to do, just to make sure exercises are kept safe. Um, 
our mission or the mission that we define for ourselves at Google um, is basically that red teams are adversarial simulations. Um, we limit ourselves to the digital realm, so which is why we have information systems in there. Um, the three main parts to the mission are we want to improve detection and response capabilities because um, if you have a detection and response team and they're not seeing any attacks, that doesn't mean that they're not there, right? On the one hand, it could mean that, yes, there actually are no attackers maybe, but on the other hand, it could also be that you are being under attack, but your detection capabilities are not good enough to pick up on them. Um, and the, the red team approach is a good way where the red team actually keeps notes of everything that, that we do. And then that allows the blue team uh, to compare notes uh, and see what actions they saw, what actions they didn't see, and, and where they can improve their capabilities. Um, the second part to the mission is, um, well, as I said, security reviews are typically fairly narrowly scoped. Um, so rating exercises, on the other hand, as part of the exercise, already have to like move laterally between systems, escalate privileges, and so on. Um, so what we're also trying to do as the second part of our mission is to make this kind of like moving inside the network much harder for adversaries. And in a lot of cases, you're probably not going to be able to restrict that entirely because like you still want your network to be usable and your actual engineers have work to do. Um, but you can at least try to like limit the paths that an attacker can take and have really good detection capabilities for those paths that, that, um, that are still left open. Um, one thing that is importantly missing from the second bullet is um, finding vulnerabilities. I, my personal opinion is that red teams are horribly inefficient at finding security vulnerabilities. Like, if you want to find bugs, it is so much better and more effective to use like security reviews or penetration tests because you have so much more information. Um, basically, um, using a red team to find vulnerabilities is kind of like blindfolding yourself. Um, given that you want to restrict the information that you have access to, to just what the attacker can see. And then the third part is that red team exercises are a pretty neat security awareness tool in the sense that um, for both executives and teams, it is like one thing to read about the compromise of a random company in the newspaper, but it's something completely different to actually see, hey, this could happen to us as well. So it, it is really good to raise the security awareness of, of what an adversary could potentially do were they to attack the company. Um, I already mentioned with regard to the scope that there are no real limitations. It includes everything, right? Like systems, people, processes. And if you read, um, like FireEye reports, all the other threat intel reports that are out there and, and pay a little bit of attention to what real adversaries do. Like, yes, there are a lot of adversaries out there that use ODAs, for example, but there's also a ton of adversaries that are fairly technically unsophisticated, right? That, that use, for example, phishing. Um, and then there's the medium uh, sophistication uh, adversaries, I guess, that, that like don't have all days, but at least run sophisticated phishing attacks. Uh, so basically, like we are not limiting ourselves to just attacking the systems and using vulnerabilities to achieve the goals that we set ourselves, but rather we also attack um, people, not physically, obviously, uh, but via social engineering and trying to convince them to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and also processes, like for example, say a process could be the password reset process, right? That, that a company has that, that can be targeted and confused or abused. Um, yeah, which also means that when you run a red team exercise, you can't really plan where the issues are going to be that, that you find in the course of a red team exercise. Like you will probably, even though you're not actively trying to find vulnerabilities, you may need vulnerabilities just as a tool to help you get closer to, towards your goal. 
Um, however, it, it usually doesn't make sense to, for example, scope a red team exercise to a product because even if you target the product itself, like you may compl find completely different vulnerabilities in, say, the onboarding process where uh, you kind of like sneaked in a rogue employee through the onboarding process. Um, it's also important to mention that given the super broad scope, red teams are also not comprehensive, right? That means they do not claim to try and find all possible vulnerabilities that are in the systems or even all possible vulnerabilities in people or processes, but rather they just represent like the easiest path or one of the many paths that an attacker could use to achieve their goals. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about building a red team. So first off, who needs a red team? Um, typically, this is something for organizations that um, have reasonably mature security practices. So I realized that the title of um, this talk is like the best offense, uh, the best defense is a good offense, uh, which is a really catchy title. But really, if you don't have a detection uh, and response team, if you don't do vulnerability management, if um, like you don't do security reviews, then red teaming is probably not the thing that you should build first. Uh, but rather, if you have all those things, then red teaming can really help you take your defenses to, to the next level. Um, for one thing where, for even a company that doesn't have uh, the security controls in place right now may still be useful is to use a red team exercise for security awareness, right? And to kind of demonstrate to leadership that, oh, we actually need to invest in those defenses. For a case like that, it is probably cheaper and more efficient to like pay a third party to run a red team exercise on your company rather than build one yourself. Because like until all the defenses are actually funded and built, your red team is just going to have a field day and like have one success after the other, which is, which is really just like demotivating to all the other security folks in, in the company. Um, Funnily enough, most red teams start out, at least from like the conversations that I had with other red teamers, start out similar to, to the one that I built, which is basically very small, right? Often it's a couple of pen testers or security interested folks who kind of want to run this for a company. And that's totally okay, right? Like having a couple of people that do red team exercises part time is a really good way to get started in a red team space and, and then use the outcomes of those exercises to just um, funding the, the red team more. And then as you start to mature the red team, you probably want to build relationships with stakeholders. You want to mature your processes and structure. Um, you want to increase the capabilities so you're able to, to simulate uh, a wide variety of adversaries. Um, and you, you could also, for example, unless you already have something in your company like that, build up a remediation team um, if, if necessary, to then address the findings. Um, let's talk a little bit about, whoops, about capabilities that a red team can have. So on the one hand, you, as I already mentioned, want to simulate a wide variety of, of different adversaries. And those adversaries have a fairly direct impact on what capabilities your red team needs to have, right? For example, if you look at nation state adversaries, they usually have access to zero day vulnerabilities. They use custom built implants. There is a significant workforce behind nation state adversaries. Like they have a lot of people that they can throw at a problem. Uh, they have a lot of patience. They don't necessarily need results in the order of weeks, right? If they uh, have an initial compromise and then lay low on your network for like six months or a year or longer, that may, may be for perfectly okay to them. Um, their detection to tolerance varies greatly, right? It depends. Some countries really don't care if they get detected. Um, others, on the other hand, like mostly Western countries probably, uh, have a lot lower tolerance to being detected just because it is bad PR. Um, there's also criminal groups. There's usually a huge spectrum. Like some are almost similar to nation states. Others are very basic. It really depends on, on the exact type of criminal group that, that you want to simulate. Um, many also have access to zero days just because there's a black market where if the group has enough money, they can just go and buy, um, an ODA. 
Um, some have custom built implants. Typically, they have at least less core stuff, even though if you look at like some of the ransomware actors, like they have entire call centers where, where they field support calls. Um, they usually want to achieve their goal quickly, like they have way less patience, for example, than, than the nation state adversary. And their tolerance to detection also varies greatly depending on where they are based and where their victims are, right? Like a criminal group based in the US is probably going to be very careful because they don't want to go to jail. However, a criminal group in North Korea probably has no problem at all, like being very noisy when they target um, European or US companies. Um, hacktivists, there's a large spectrum, right? It can range from like a random script kitty who's just playing around with Metasploit to a seasoned penetration tester that has serious security expertise. Um, it can also range from like lone wolf kind of attacker to like the, the lapsus collective, right? Where, where there's more of a group. Um, that runs the attacks, they usually don't really have zero day capabilities. They often rely very much on, on social engineering, um, and, and open source implants. And then finally, you have the malicious insider. Um, those are basically often disgruntled employees. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be disgruntled employees. Could also be people who are being blackmailed, people who are being bribed. Um, yeah. Um, they typically don't really care about their job, right? If they get fired or not. However, what they do care about is that nobody ever wants to go to jail. So they want to be careful that they don't get caught because the worst case scenario for them is that, that they do go to jail. Typically, they have a lot less security background and, and expertise and sophistication. But on the other hand, they have the advantage that they are going to be very familiar with the systems they are attacking, right? Because this is kind of like their home network where, where they work in every day. Um, they also start out with a lot of access uh, initially. If you compare, for example, a criminal group to a malicious insider, the malicious insider is already on the network, so they kind of have a huge starting advantage, right? They don't need to go for a foothold first. Um, they can use what they already have as part of their job. Uh, which one to simulate is really up to you and depends on your company and uh, what you want to simulate, right? And, and the business that you run. Um, Google, for example, will have very different adversaries than like a company that manufactures tires. Um, also think about when, when you try to figure out which adversary to, to simulate, you can think about like, what are the things that you want to change or improve in the organization in terms of security? And then you can pick accordingly. If you want to, um, like make your company more resilient against zero day attacks, then you probably want to pick like a nation state or a very sophisticated criminal group. However, if you want to prove that, um, I don't know, you should improve your, your vulnerability management process. Um, then you, you can simulate like a, a hacktivist. Um, so very useful capabilities to have are tooling, right? You want stuff like an implant that has command and control, like some sort of C2. Uh, you want recon tools. The recon has, on the one hand, often produces a lot of information, right? So you want to have the ability to filter it down very quickly. On the other hand, there's a lot of like automated recon tools because it's just a very manual and boring process. So you want to automate some of that. Uh, phishing, it's usually useful to kind of like track your phishing and implement some TTPs that real adversaries are using. For example, that like each email has a unique ID, that like the payloads can only be downloaded once and those sort of things. Um, so that, that those are all good uh, capabilities to have. Um, you want to have some sort of attacker infrastructure. This is actually where initially the team was really terrible. Like our infrastructure that we used for attack infrastructure was basically like some random Google Cloud VMs that we pulled up uh, that kept crashing and having problems uh, because we, we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to like good 
uh, engineering practices. So as we grew and matured, we started to actually have like monitoring and all the things that you have on a production network to make sure that you're able to remotely manage your um, attacker infrastructure as the adversary that you're simulating and react quickly so then so that you don't lose out on a victim. Um, it's always super frustrating, right? You finally have your compromise, you have a foothold in where you want to be, and then like you lose it because you have a bug in your system. Um, in terms of exploits, there you can either have many days, right, which is basically like Metasploits or Canvas, um, or whatever it is out there. Um, you can use one days, which is basically like vulnerabilities that, where the vendor knows about them and they're being fixed, but the patch hasn't been rolled out yet. So you have kind of like a much shorter period of time to, to build an exploit for a vulnerability like that. And you have, you can have zero days. Um, if you want to simulate like a nation state adversaries, they typically have access to zero day vulnerabilities. However, for a red team, there are lots of caveats, right? For example, for most red teams, it doesn't scale super well, um, to, to try and go ahead and find lots of security, uh, all days in, in, uh, standard off the shelf, uh, software like the economies of scale are very different between a real adversary and a red team like a real adversary they find one vulnerability and they can use it across like dozens of of targets however you as someone who works in security probably don't want to sit on an all day vulnerability right so you get to use it once in one exercise if you're lucky and you're like fast enough to use it before it gets patched um, and, and, and then that, that's kind of it. So there's like this huge investment that you have to make and, and then you can only get to use it once. The other thing is that they're almost impossible to defend against, right? So if you keep using Odays against your blue team, your blue team is probably at some point just going to throw up their hands in, uh, in frustration because like, what are they going to do about it? Right? So some things you could do if you say, okay, I want to use zero days to, to test like the defense in depth and the capabilities of the blue team to then detect once the attacker is on the network. Um, you can just as well use other approaches, like for example, using a billing victim, um, with like a good narrative so that the artifacts are all there. Um, yeah, some of those capabilities are available commercially, obviously, right? So you can just buy them. Uh, at a certain size of a team, it may make sense for you to build those capabilities yourself. Um, for example, fun fact, our implants that, that we use on the Red Team at Google did go through a security review uh, just because we wanted to make sure that we don't introduce security vulnerabilities in the systems that, that we compromise. Um, some may be difficult to get uh, for example, Odes, so you may have to find alternative approaches like using billing victims or uh, using one days usually as a very good replacement. And some you kind of have to build yourself uh, infrastructure, even though nowadays there's like some actually pretty good red teaming uh, infrastructure in terms of like Ansible scripts, for example, that, that you can run that spins up a, a fairly reasonable infrastructure. Um, if you go and hire for your red team, like what are the things that you want to keep an eye out for? Um, on the positive side, you probably want to look for like a security background, right? People who have been doing pen testing or obviously red teaming. Um, so they should be able to spot vulnerabilities but then also go ahead and exploit vulnerabilities, at least to a certain extent. Like they don't need to be the, the master exploiters who can build like, uh, who can use a, a double free in Chrome and build an exploit in five minutes. Uh, but some amount of exploitation is definitely useful. Um, the most important thing that we found, um, when, when we hire for Red Team is kind of like this attacker mindset, right? It's the always questioning, how can I bypass this? What are the potential path, paths that I can take to, to get closer to, to my goal? And that's a little bit difficult to interview for, but like kind of walking the candidate through scenarios or having them explain scenarios, uh, to you. Uh, can, can be a fairly good way to, to identify someone who has a good attacker mindset. Now, other positive indicators are like people who participate in bug bounty programs, right? Because, you know, they can find vulnerabilities. Same goes for people who have a few CVEs to their name. 
uh, presentations at known security conferences. CTFs are always good, right? Because it's kind of like solving, those people like solving puzzles. Um, and they're usually also fairly good at, at red teaming. Um, some scripting tooling is also always good to have. Um, what is at least not enough by itself is like people who just are super good with security tools. Like you may know Nessus or Metasploit inside out, but if that's all, uh, you know, then that's probably not enough for, for being on a red team. Other things that are very specialized and, and can be really good in, in other parts or in other security domains are by themselves also not necessarily enough for red teaming, right? Even if you're a very good reverse engineer, like reverse engineering is a tiny percentage of, of the work that people spend on, on, on a red team. Like there is just as much social engineering, if not more involved than there is reverse engineering. As the team grows, once you go kind of like beyond 20 people, then you can also look into specialization, right? Then it may make sense to actually hire like a reverse engineering expert who then across different exercises helps with the reverse engineering part in, in exercises. Same goes for like exploitation and, and vulnerability research fuzzing. Um, all right, who are the key relationships and stakeholders that, that you want to keep an eye on? Um, so leadership, it's absolutely critical that you have support from leadership. There is always a certain risk involved with the red team exercises. So you want to make sure that leadership has your back in, in case things go wrong. Um, in security aware organizations, red teams can actually be a really good tool for the security team leadership to like effect change in the organization, right? In the, in, in the larger one, because they can take your exercises and go to their fellow VPs or SVPs or whatever and, and justify why they need more budget, why they need more people, why they need to implement new security controls. Um, then DNR. Detection response team, aka blue team, is your primary customer, right? We exist to support DNR. Um, and it's basically like, it's very easy to build an adversarial relationship with DNR, right? You're doing adversarial simulations. You're basically trying to bypass them. You're trying to make sure that, that they don't detect you. However, in the end, it's still very important that, that, uh, you have a good relationship. And that you realize red team can't win if blue team doesn't also win. Um, threat intel is always good, right? If you have a threat intel team, then they're usually a very good partner to discuss like who are the adversaries that you should simulate. Um, legal is, is, is a good partner because a lot of the times there are like legal questions around exercises. For example, are we legally allowed to impersonate someone when we run an exercise? Um, in particular around like sensitive areas, say, uh, like certificate authorities, where there's a lot like regulatory, um, requirements or SEC filings, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then you also probably want to build a relationship with some product teams. It depends on the industry, right? For, for us, like every product team has their own kind of like software engineers that are building them. And for like the example I used before, the tire manufacturer, any security issue that you find there is probably going to fix by the corporate IT department. So like build the relationships with, depending on your industry, who you think can actually help you get the issues addressed. Um, the most important safeguards that, that we have in place for our red team are the rules of engagement. So they kind of like outline the rules of, of uh, the exercises. Common topics that, that are found in rules of engagement are like not introducing security vulnerabilities as, as you execute an exercise, no denial of service, right? You don't want to break anything and cause an incident. Um, do not take any actions where you don't understand the consequences of, of the action. Never touch any customer data. Never touch systems that aren't fully owned or managed by, by the company. Um, generally accessing corporate data is okay. Uh, but like, be careful not to snoop around because like the other employees, uh, are kind of gonna get antsy. Um, no threats or causing emotional distress. Like, please do not call in a bomb threat, right? That that may work to get everyone out of the building, but you gotta be in, in a lot of trouble afterwards. Um, limitations with regard to timing. Uh, for example, you may not want to like keep the blue team around on a Friday afternoon or evening uh, because they just happen to detect the red team exercise then. 
uh, notification requirements, what kind of cleanup you have to do, and, and so on. Uh, you can also think how to deal with zero-day vulnerabilities. Like, if you find a zero-day vulnerability, and a zero-day vulnerability doesn't always need to be like in a third-party uh, software, right? It can also be in like your own systems. How do you want to go about it? Um, do you need to report it immediately? Because then uh, that kind of outs the, the red team exercise to, to the rest of the company. Or is it okay if you, I don't know, have some sort of period of time where you can sit on the vulnerability, say, a week or two or, or a little bit more uh, b before you have to report it? Um, we also keep an activity log of all the actions that we take. Just so that on the one hand, it, it kind of serves two purposes. On the one hand, uh, it helps the blue team distinguish between real attacks and us. Um, because there are still real attacks, right? And you probably want to have some kind of mechanism for the blue team to determine, uh, are we being attacked for real or is this just our red team? And, and this is the tool that we use. It's also a safeguard for the red team itself because like sometimes questions come up like, why did this person access this data? They're not supposed to have access to this data, right? And then you can point to the activity log and say like, look, we took this action because it was part of a red team exercise and like here are the reasons why we did that. Um, when it comes to execution, there are a few different types of exercises that, that we run at Google. Um, all of this terminology, by the way, is Google specific, right? So this is not anything standardized or anything. Feel free to use your own names. Um, but basically, we distinguish between red team and red cell exercises. Uh, they're testing two different things. Um, Basically, for red team exercises, we let the response part of the DNR team know that we run this exercise. And this means that once the exercise is detected and gets escalated to the response team, they know this is an exercise and they decide not to respond to it. Um, however, at least twice a year, we also want to make sure that they test the whole playbook for a response, right? And say, be prepared for if there is an actual large-scale attack or security breach. So twice a year, we run something that, that we call Red Cell, where we do not tell the response team, uh, neither the detection nor the response team. And then they actually like uh, do the whole playbook, right? Like confiscate machines, interview people, uh, do digital forensics, uh, escalate to the contacts that they have that they would usually escalate and, and so on. Um, another type that we have is orange team exercises. That is kind of the volunteer arm of, of the team. Um, orange team exercises are much smaller in scope, but that is an opportunity for other engineers uh, in the company that are interested in security to take a step of uh, at trying to basically hack Google, right? So uh, they get assigned a referee, which is a, uh, an experienced security engineer who kind of like um, make sure that the exercise remains safe. There's also a set of um, more stringent uh, rules of engagement. The quality of these exercises can be a little bit of a mixed bag, but the really good thing is that it increases diversity in the sense that um, adversaries come from all backgrounds, right? And, and like, um, if you have a static team of like five to ten people or so, then the number of perspectives you're gonna get is kind of gonna be limited, right? And you can expand those perspectives by using volunteers from all over the company that like just try different ideas that that adversaries uh, may try as well. Um, when you plan an exercise, try to uh, get good coverage, right? So basically, like on one hand, you probably want to cover all the various adversaries that, that potentially target your company. Um, also try to cover all the different parts of the business um, that an adversary may be interested in. Always good to chat to your threat intel team if you have one. If you don't have one, that's okay as well, right? There's like a lot of uh, freely available threat intel reports. Uh, from Mandiant and then FireEye and, and whatever else, like where, where you can get a pretty good understanding of what is the threat landscape out there and who is likely to attack you. Um, when you define uh, the scenario, we typically um, basically set up who is the adversary that we're simulating, what is the motivation, right? Why are they doing that? 
Um, and what are the goals of the attacker? What do they want to achieve? Like typically an attacker is actually very focused on in what they want to do, right? Say uh, for Google, that could be as an attacker, I want to get access to someone's Gmail inbox. Um, so we, we try to simulate that and set up very specific uh, goals for for each individual exercise. We don't just set goals for the attackers, but also for the exercise and personal goals for the red teamers. So for example, if there is, I don't know, a person on the team who's super interested in machine learning, right? Then we can try to run an exercise where we set personal goals for one of the attackers that they learn something about machine learning. And then they kind of like, since the scope is open uh, so much, they, they can try to find a, a vector where, where they leverage machine learning in some way. Um, we usually document all of that in, in a planning document, which describes the scenario, um, the scope, uh, usually not what is in scope, just because it's so broad, but if there are specific things that are out of scope, just because they're like too dangerous, for example, then, then we put that in explicitly. Um, we usually have a plan in there how to kick off the exercise, like what are the first initial steps that you want to take, what is the starting point of the exercise. Um, and, and then we communicate that document to like all the relevant stakeholders who need to know about the exercise. Um, so that's kind of like the execution phase of the exercise, right? So we come up with the ideation, then the planning doc, then we notify all the stakeholders. And then the actual hands on hacking part is kind of like usually doing a lot of reconnaissance. At some point, you find something that gives you access to more information. You use that for more reconnaissance and so on until you finally achieve your goals. It is very rare in an exercise that it's like one bug and you're done, right? Usually you have to like do lateral movement multiple times, escalate your privileges and, and so on. The duration of this is usually like anywhere between two and four months, uh, sometimes longer. Um, the post execution phase, and we were very careful with naming that phase. It is not post exercise, but post execution, because we want to signal to, to the team that this is still part of the exercise and is super important, right? Up to that point, you haven't actually generated any value. You may have like, have completely pwned your entire company. But like that doesn't provide any value until it results in security improvements. So in the post-execution phase, um, we basically write the report, we do presentations, uh, we document the TTPs. TTPs is short for tactics, techniques, and procedures, and it is often what the blue team uses to kind of like uh, build uh, detection capabilities. So that's our interface to the blue team, how we communicate with them. And then we also do the remediation onboarding where, where we tell the remediation team about the exercise and then eventually the handoff of all the issues that, that we found so that they can get started and talk to the affected teams uh, to get things fixed. Um, the exercise report serves multiple purposes. On the one hand, it documents the exercise, but the second part, which I think is much more important, is that it's supposed to tell a story. So that is to raise security awareness. Ideally, I would like all the uh, reports to kind of read like a postmortem from Man the End of FireEye, right? Uh, just because it is much more interesting. So we invest a lot in our reports and we spend a fairly significant amount of time on those to make sure that they're actually compelling and interesting and, and people read them as opposed to like just a list of issues, um, which usually is, is just something people find fairly boring. It also helps to contextualize the security issues and, and makes the impact much, much clearer. Um, the structure is, is like this. Uh, I'm kind of behind a little bit in terms of timing, so I'm going to move fairly quickly. But like we have an executive summary, then the high level recommendations, which is like the, the top, uh, recommendations that we have, which often like aggregate multiple issues in ones. Then the attack narrative, that's kind of the meaty part, which explains what happens in, in the form of a postmortem. The detection analysis, where we look at like what things were detected, what things were not detected, how, how can detection, uh, improve the capabilities and make sure that next time it will be detected. Uh, what are the identified issues, the TTPs that we used, and then very important also the affected teams and the distribution list, like who actually gets access to the report since it's obviously very sensitive. Um, other ways to, to communicate the results is like a presentation. Um, we, usually this is limited to part of the 
security team, in particular the blue team, because we want them to primarily benefit and really understand what we did so they can uh, react to it. We sometimes also include like friendly product security teams, uh, but not necessarily affected teams, just so we can be super frank in those presentations. Um, when we notify the affected teams, we usually do that at the like tech lead level. Um, so not the leadership, just because, uh, like if, if a VP reads about an exercise first, then they get panicky and like start pushing down very heavy handedly. Uh, and we want to give the actual engineers working on the product an opportunity to first kind of like kick off some remediation projects, make sure nobody panics. And then usually a few weeks afterwards, we, we also notify uh, the leadership, so they're aware and don't learn about it uh, from like hallway uh, conversations. Um, we also do executive presentations. Those are usually basically security awareness exercises for for our senior leadership. We do them in a batched way, meaning that we present uh, like three exercises at once, and we only do it once a quarter or so. Uh, it's a really cool security awareness tool that, that also helps us get funding if we have like the visibility at this level. Um, and then once you have multiple exercises, it becomes really interesting to start at kind of like aggregating results. Like, are there any patterns that you have noticed? How are the controls working? Which ones are effective? Which ones has your security, uh, your, your red team been able to bypass and kind of like do an analysis on a meta level where, where you kind of like aggregate the results from multiple exercises. Um, the TTP handoff, um, is when, when like the, Tactics, techniques, and procedures are handed off to the blue team. Um, they need to be detailed enough uh, to build new detections. So in combination with the activity log, um, they, they should be enough for the blue team to um, like make new signals and hunt and whatever else they build in order to detect adversaries. Uh, and then we also help them by trying to do a prioritization from our perspective. Um, where we kind of like say these we think are the most likely to, to be used by an actual adversary. Um, for remediation, we have our own team. They do something like scoping, working with the affected team to make sure that the fix is comprehensive. Um, they gather commitments from the affected teams, like making sure it gets put on their OKRs and priorities, and they do tracking. Um, we distinguish between vulnerabilities. Those are usually fairly easy to fix, right? They're fairly clear cut. You have like an XSS in your web application. But then a lot of times, like the much harder to fix issues are security improvements, where it's not like a clear cut vulnerability, but it's more like raising the bar and making it more difficult. And there it's much more difficult to, to convince teams to invest there. It kind of like gets, uh, it, it competes with like other product features, right? It has to pr be prioritized against that. Um, red teams versus real adversaries. I already talked about the economies of scale that are very different. Uh, there are some attacks that are very challenging to simulate. For example, zero days, um, supply chain compromise, right? You can't go ahead and actually compromise a GitHub uh, package that has like a thousand other customers uh, to simulate a supply chain attack. So there you kind of like have to have to come up with workarounds or DDoS attacks is another one that, that's very difficult to, to simulate. Uh, it's also important to be aware of bias. Like internal, internal red teams often have a lot of bias because they're very familiar with the infrastructure. Um, in my opinion, the most important bias, though, is that red teams know what doesn't work and therefore don't even attempt it. And real adversaries don't, right? And that is how they get caught. They try things, they fail, and, and that's when they get caught. So I think that that's one area where you kind of like still need to try those things, even though you know that they actually fail if, if you want to do very realistic simulations. Um, Cheating, aka white cards, can uh, be a way to kind of like bypass some of the problems. For example, zero days, right? You may not have the resources to build uh, or fuzz your own zero days. So in that case, you can work with willing victims. Uh, you can reuse compromises from previous exercises. The downside is that you kind of like lose the end-to-end -end narrative, right? Um, and then some random tricks and tips. Uh, we're using rotationers, so people from other security teams or other parts of the security team that can help us get new perspectives, get expertise from other parts of the company. 
Um, in terms of attacker mindset, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. So we don't like do interviews or something with rotationers. Uh, so sometimes it's not a perfect fit, but that's usually okay overall. I think it's, it's still worth the value. And if it works out, not only did you run a really cool exercise, but also you now have an alley in that product security team where the rotation had come from. There's also uh, a way to build a purple program, right? Which is kind of like build, uh, bridging the gap between red and blue and making sure that the relationship is always good. Um, one thing that is a little bit of a challenge is that if your red team is successful in not only finding, but also getting things fixed, then the difficulty of your red team exercises will go up and they will take longer, right? So you, you need to take that into account. And then there's always a certain amount of pressure to succeed, which is mostly for like psychological safety of the people on the team, um, that you can like also provide them alternatives and like really running back to back exercises can be quite exhausting. So on our team, for example, we have options for people to, um, like do a tooling quarter, right? Where they work on our implant for a quarter or something like that, just so they're able to like disconnect a little bit from constantly running attacks. All right. And that is that. How am I time wise? Uh, okay, let's let's put it that way. Um, we're going to take a break. Are you going to be around for for a little bit? Yes, I'm going to hang out outside at the Google booth. So if you want to chat with me, just drop by. Excellent. That sounds like a fantastic plan. Please give it up for Dave and Fabian. Thank you.